Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Be marvelous how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you love the Jews and sing at the cross? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I call. Tremble then and do not sing. Speak to your heart and silence upon your head. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. In the air of sin, who will show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine abound. In the east I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me rest secure. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do not know, what we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him, but we will see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone does what is right, is righteous, just as he is righteous. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Stood among 
the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. I'm currently in the middle of reading this very fascinating book. I, I was recommended this book by one of the reviews that I read, and I gotta say, you know, just because I have two cats, I thought the Cat's Meow would be a great read. I didn't realize it was going to be a page turner, and it really is. It's a conversational kind of book, and the whole title is The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa. <laughs> It's written by Jonathan Lasos. Now he makes these premises about understanding the way that the cat from the savannah comes to be the cat that stares at you at six o'clock in the morning waiting for you to put food in its bowl. And he makes these really cool arguments throughout about how, like at the very beginnings, how cats decided that humans were to be befriended. It probably doesn't come the way you think, like you put a little bowl of food out and the cat comes to you. Wild cats are a little different. And so as people evolved from living, an, uh, living off the land to living more of an agrarian society, meaning that there were settlements and food was farmed, cats started to evolve with the farms. So as people moved from settlement to settlement, and as they made these storage barns, or these silos, eventually there were animals that decided that they could live off of human life too, right? These are the rats, the mice, the raccoons, the squirrels, oh, those happy little squirrels, the chipmunks, all of them coming and, and taking the grain that humans would have gathered. And then thus, the cats followed along afterward. He makes these really interesting arguments about everything that you never thought you want to ask about a cat. For example, you know, for the most part we understand that there's a little wild in every cat, especially my snowball. When the earthquake happened, she ran into the box spring, into the box spring and hid out there. I mean, we couldn't get her at all, but every cat has this wild inhibition to it. Last night, Garfield, as I was writing the sermon, Garfield was running around the room like there was something chasing her. I mean, it was just the most bizarre behavior. So he, he makes this note, he's a sociologist and a biologist, and he makes this note that cats that are wild have shorter intestines than cats that are domesticated. And that's how they first started finding out how cats became domesticated is once the cat's intestines got longer than a wild, I mean, this is just way too much more information than I ever thought I would need to know. 
but it's because wildcats only eat rodents. They are, they're carnivorous. But domesticated cats, house pets, eat more like, uh, eat more vegetables and grains than wildcats. And so apparently your intestines needs to be longer to digest all of that rubbish. Ruffage, not rubbish, ruffage. I did notice the other day as I was opening up some new cat food cans for my cats that there were peas inside, and I was wondering what this would do for the cat who usually eats meat. Not only that, but they also noted, he also notes that cat brains are different sizes. If you're a wild cat, you actually have, surprisingly, a bigger brain. Now, a bigger brain isn't always a better brain. A domestic cat has a smaller brain because the two areas that are biggest in a, a wild cat are the areas of fear and anxiety. Whereas domestic cats, as much as they think that they are really afraid of anything, they actually don't have as many fears. And so their brains just don't develop the same way. At one point, the author makes this note about genetics and how influential human activity has been on the genes of a cat. He notes that there were, at one point, these, anybody have a munchkin at home? It's literally, that's a cat breed, a munchkin breed. Anybody know what a munchkin looks like? They're, they're adorable, but they have short legs. So they were genetically altered to have these short legs. And they're not big bounders or anything like that. They're really close to the ground. Think of like a Dutch hound dog, really close to the ground, kind of adorable. They have fur. And at one point, he mentions that, you know, at some point, some human along the lines thought that one of these munchkins would be really great with one of those Egyptian hairless cats. And so they took this, these two cats and they put them together through mating and things like that, and all of a sudden you have a munchkin with, a, with no hair. And, and he comments, he's like, if you ever want to see a freakishly adorable cat, and he, he emphasizes the word freakish, then you might want to look at these munchkins that are hairless. He eventually gets to this point where he talks about how not all of uh, human activity in a cat's life has been beneficial. He mentions at one point that these Persian cats, you know the, the really cute Persian cats that have long hair? And those little noses, they're, they're very short and they're or very small and very like up on the face. Actually, they're between two eyeballs. They've been genetically altered that way through many, many generations of mating. Because people found the short little tiny nose, the long fur, and the nose moved up on the, on the face, so adorable. So they tried everything they could to promote this kind of activity. He said, if you look at the great, 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 great grandparents of the Persian cat, they wouldn't look anything like they look today. In fact, they look more like a normal cat. He said that there's a problem when humans get involved with this kind of temptation to mold things that look cute. The Persian cat is described as not the smartest cat. In fact, he writes about how many times Persian cats apparently walk into walls. And it has something to do with the fact that the nose never really fully develops on the outside. So a cat's nose then has to develop on the inside. And it, it undercuts the development of the brain. Fascinating stuff, right? So, I got to reading this, and I got to reading the gospel, and you never put these two things together, right? I mean, you never read a fun book and the Bible at the same time, because then the questions just abound. And the question that came to my mind is, if humans are so integral in designing the pets that they want, the cats that they want, the breeds that they want, then what will a cat look like in heaven? <laughs> when it's not supposed to look this way. Like when the Persian cat is supposed to have a bigger nose and a more developed brain. When the cat goes to heaven, what will the cat look like? Now, we know that there are a lot of questions about heaven. And last week we talked about the way that even after the resurrection, Jesus still had his scars. That things weren't completely perfect. 
however we might think of perfection. And I know kids around the world who ask those most bizarre questions that we never think about. These are the questions that come out, and they're asking for sincerity's sake, but there's a humor behind them. We know that when people who lose a limb in life for various reasons, sometimes their question is, will I regain that limb back in heaven? Somebody who might donate a kidney or a liver or some kind of organ or lung to those who need it. In heaven, whose kidney or liver or organ will they be? Will a blind person who was born blind somehow receive their sight in heaven? Because in our minds, that seems to be the more optimal way of living. Or, as some blind people say, that they'd rather not have their sight because they can see things that we can't because they rely on other intuitive methods. What about those who are living in our transgender community? Those who say that they were born in a different body. What will they look like? How will they be living into that fullness of who God made them to be? How about when we die, what age will we be? When we get into heaven, will we be at the peak performance or will we be at the age that we passed away at? And of course, this is the most pressing issue of them all. Because every time I hear about heaven, I hear about the heavenly smorgasbord that goes along with it. So will we be able to eat without end and still maintain whatever figure we want? Now, of course, these questions can't be answered. Not on this side, not if we're truthful, not if we're living deeply into what it means to be faithful to God. But there is one question a kid would ask about our reading today that does make a lot of sense. When Jesus asked to eat the fish, he was in a resurrected body. So the fish at one point was a real fish and then became dinner. And does the fish then get into a resurrected body as well after Jesus eats the fish? And if that's true, does the fish then get offered up again later on in the heavenly kingdom as part of the smorgasbord? And does that mean that the fish then gets re-resurrected every time it gets eaten? These are the kind of confusing questions a kid would ask. A few months ago, the progressive magazine called Christian Century came out with a series of articles all about the human biome and how important it is that humans understand the complexity of our biome. We have these probiotics and we have these enzymes and we have these germs and we have these cells that are all living inside of us. And uh, roughly every seven years, our whole body remakes itself from all that makes us up. The Christian Century had several writers who talked about how we will still, based on this text, still have our digestive enzymes in heaven, and that they will still be there in the fullness of whatever they are, that they, just like us, won't die. But then again, we've got a question, what does that look like? So all these questions abound this day. This is the day that we just kind of get lost in our own wondering. And it's all okay. The one question I do want to focus in on is the one question Jesus asked the disciples. Have you anything to eat? Now Jesus isn't focusing on what is going to happen tomorrow, which is probably something the disciples were really worried about. As we read from the different Gospels, we get this sense that the disciples were wondering, what is the mission now that they have to serve? Because their rabbi, the one that they were following, was crucified. And they were hearing from the, this is still Easter day in the Gospel of Luke. They were hearing that there's this resurrected body. What does that mean? And we hear the tension of these disciples as they were in wonder and fear. As they had clarity and yet had questions and befuddled. 
what do these disciples want to focus on except what happens tomorrow? And yet Jesus focuses them on the present. Have you anything to eat? Now the other thing is that once you see your friend that you you kind of abandoned along the way, once you see that friend and he's resurrected in front of you, the other thought that the disciples might have is, oh my gosh, we're in a lot of trouble. I mean, the last time we've seen Jesus was when we were running away from Jesus and Jesus was being committed to the cross. Jesus is probably a little angry with us right now. But Jesus doesn't mention anything about what happened in the past either. Again, the question is in the present. Do you have anything to eat? This question brings up a whole lot more questions. Like, what does happen to that fish? But Jesus isn't offering a theological argument at this point. Nor is Jesus trying to get the disciples to feel like they need many hours of therapy after this experience because they don't know what to make out of it. All Jesus is asking is in this present to put everything else aside and to understand that right now all that's needed is something to eat. And the disciples have that. They have a fish. <coughs> So maybe our question, if Jesus were to come into this space, and Jesus is in this space, let's just say it this way. As Jesus is in this space, the question that Jesus might ask us is not, do you have anything to eat? But rather, what do you have to share with me, with my friends, with this community I choose to travel in, with this world that I chose to save, what do you have to share? My friends, it is so easy right now to get so bogged down with the what ifs of tomorrow or the what happens of the past. And Jesus is asking us, just in this moment, focus on this meeting, this moment where Jesus is just saying, do you have anything to share? I bet you we all have something to share. It might not be fish or food, but it might be other ways that this world really needs some support. The least we can do these days is to offer our prayers for those who are in circumstances that are needing and trying. But then we also know we are, as the disciples know, Christ's hands in this world, Christ's feet in this world. Christ's body in this world. So we can get bogged down with a whole bunch of questions, and sometimes that's fun. Sometimes we can laugh at the questions. But let us just stay in the moment, just this once, and just focus on what is Christ asking us to share. Amen.
rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. O oh God, you're our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers as we share the holy meal that is the body and blood of Jesus given for us. Lead us to share all that we have and find in generosity abundant life. For God of grace. O oh God, our Creator, you bring forth all life upon earth. Calm storms, bring water to parched places, and protect the climate that this planet would sustain life in all its variety. God of grace. O oh God, our Savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, and elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people, including the people of Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, and all places besieged by conflict. God of grace. O oh God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are in times of transition, facing the loss of old ways and routines, and anticipating change. Guide those who journey in illness, grief, hope, and uncertainty, especially Joan, Lynn, Anne-Marie, Rosa, Abby, Bonnie, Paul, Beata, Barbara, Bill, John, Mikey, Ginny, Gerda, all those in our bulletin and those we mention now, either aloud or in the silent places of our hearts. God of grace, O oh God, our center, you bring all people together in you. Help us to remember our identity and purpose are in our ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. God of grace, O oh God, our resting place, your son Jesus, we promise that we are held in your love forever. We remember our beloved who have died as we remember and share their love. Comfort those who mourn. God of grace, into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love, through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. May you share that peace.
Please rise if you're able. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true and paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Uh, the white and the bread is a bonus treat for us today. <laughs> no wheat flour, that's okay. We love it.
prepared a table before us, us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. You may be seated. There was your heart. Come on forward. Here he comes. <laughs> Ladies. I get to announce everybody. <laughs> so we got a very special book today that comes from the recommendation of two of our deacons. So Deacon Nancy and Deacon Vicky were at a retreat last year, last fall, and they found this book and it spoke to them about how wonderful they are. And even our disciples, those who follow Jesus, need to know that that Jesus loves them, and so Jesus comes and visits them after his death because they're unique, they're needed, they're loved. And so the book is called I Am Me, The Book of Authenticity by Susan Verdi and art by Peter H. Reynolds. And if, you're, if you can't see the pictures, that's totally fine, just listen to the words. These things about me that make, there are things about me that make me different. Sometimes I stand out in a crowd. Sometimes I am not seen at all, and I feel alone. I start to ask myself, why can't I blend in? Fit the mold. Maybe I'm a little too much, or maybe I'm a little, maybe I am too little, or maybe too much. But when I stop and look, I see nothing in this world is exactly the same. Difference is what makes life beautiful and miraculous. And when I show who I truly am, uh -huh, I can find my joy, my spark. I have something to contribute. I can't hold back or hold it in. I am someone to be celebrated. I am me. I can have my own style and decide how I want to show up in this world. I can be grateful for my hair, my skin, my size, because they are all mine. I can be proud of my body and thankful for all it can do. I can embrace that I am perfectly imperfect, because that is what makes me interesting. I love that line. I can embrace that I am perfectly imperfect, because that is what makes me interesting. I can dance to my own rhythm anytime I want to move and groove. I can learn from others who express themselves with confidence, even when it's hard. I can be a role model for someone who is afraid to show their own true colors. I can celebrate the things of this world that I decide are most meaningful to me, like love, peace, unity, and hope. I can love anyone I choose, fully and completely, with all my heart. I can notice that every creature, small and grand, has something unique and necessary. I can know that community, connection, and acceptance exist, and I will find them. I can surround myself with those who see me, stand up for me, and support me. I can be okay knowing not everyone will understand me, because I have love for myself. I don't need to hide away, hold back, or compare myself self to others, because I am me, and I matter. You are you, and you matter. We are just right. Beautiful and miraculous, exactly as we are. The end. Let us pray, my friends. We give you thanks, God, for making us who we are. We are definitely needed in this world, and each of us has our own voice and our own way of showing love. Continue to be with us this week as we show love to our neighbors in need. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Rockbound, Ronnie. Rockbound. Please rise as you are able. Something tells me, listening to some of the news already this morning, and knowing what the, is in store for us this week, we need each other, and we need to, that sense of community 
and a time that's very trying for people in our community, in our nation, and in our world. And so let us remember to always give thanks and praise to God, and to ask, like Jesus asks of us, what can we share? Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope. Bless you now and always. Amen. Amen.